well, well, well. Well, 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 well. Just keeps moving. I'm gonna do this. How's that? Can't hear it anymore, right? Can't hear me. And I don't understand it because he puts it on his side and you can hear it fine. This is about my mom voice. I don't. No. I don't like, I don't get into yelling. I might use a firm voice, but. All right, good morning again. Let's dive right in. Kind of neat, we're actually gonna study God's promise on being his heirs. <laughs> so we're talking kind of generation and what's our inheritance. So your study guides are on your table. If you wanna kinda of keep an eye on those as I get to those. Let's pray. Father God, we thank and praise you for this morning. We thank you for a new day. I do thank you for marriage, for birth, for life, for legacies that we get to leave. We thank you for this church family. And um, Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit, um, instill in us today some new truths about this promise, Lord, that we went, might take hold of our inheritance in a brand new way today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me start with just a little story. There was a man, he entered a movie theater and he was loaded down with popcorn and pop and candy. Is that how we go to movies? <laughs> I don't like to go to movies because I don't like spending all that money. But if I am, I'm gonna go all out, <laughs> get my arms full. And the lights were dim, excuse me, and he was pacing up and down the aisle, scanning the rows try, in the dark, trying to find the people that he had come to the movie with. And after several attempts of going up and down all of the aisles, he stopped and he asked very loudly, does anybody here recognize me? <laughs> <laughs> and I thought of that when I, when I think of family sometimes. Uh, one of my daughters, the youngest, she would, we'd be opening Christmas gifts and she would be opening hers and expecting everybody to be watching her and we usually weren't. And so she'd say, hey, everybody, focus on me. <laughs> focus on me. <clears throat> See, the truth is, when we go places in life, no matter where we are, we usually like to go with people, right? I've seen you put up, you want to go to a restaurant, and so you put it on Facebook, who wants to go with? Because <laughs> you don't want to go by yourself, right? Um, we want to be with people. And maybe some of us, like me, I like alone time, so I don't have a problem going to a coffee shop alone or restaurant or just about anywhere. I don't mind going alone. But <clears throat> the truth is, even in that, I still like to belong somewhere. My family often says, you'd just be great if we weren't around, wouldn't you be? <laughs> and I said, no, I like to be alone, but that's because I know that I belong somewhere. And so it's very easy for me to be alone because I know that my family is right there if I want them or I need to spend time with them. So most of us, or all of us, like to know that there's people who care about us, right? That, that people wanna be near us, that they don't look at us and go, oh no, it's her again, or it's him again. And whether we are aware of it or not, we all need to be part of something. We need to live in community. I had someone tell me this, uh, someone close to me, and I'm thinking there was a, a hidden message in there. He said that he really doesn't like people. <laughs> and I said, oh, well, interesting, because God created us to like people. He created us to live in community. That's, that's just how um, we're wired, so to speak. We might be wired a little different, each of us, but we're wired to be with people to live in community because we know that because that's how God is. He's three in one. He likes community. <laughs> yeah, you're not following, are you? <laughs> you're all just like, huh? Wake up. <laughs> He's a God of relationship. He created Adam and Eve. Why? 
I mean, what did you say? I'm sorry. Okay. He, what did he do with Adam and Eve before they sinned? He walked and talked with them, didn't he? And he said, let's create man in our image. Let's do this. Um, and he said it's not good for man to be alone, which is why he created Eve. And so we know that we are created to live, to love, to care for, to nurture and support each other. When Jesus started his earthly ministry, what did he do? I'm not all the miracles, but what was one of the first things he did? Yep, he gathered the small group of people fellowshipping together, right? He cared for them, he shared with them, he mentored them to be leaders in the church. At his last meal, one of his most astounding things, he said, I no longer call you servants, but I call you friends. He loved fellowshipping. He also loved to get away alone with his father, but he had a desire and a need to fellowship with people. And we have that relationship with him too. We're his friends. But more than that, today we're going to talk about really being children of God. Um, God adopted us. The Bible tells us he adopted us. He promised us that we are his heirs. And as his heirs, we receive an inheritance. Now and later, by the way. That seems to come up. I should just have now and later candy with me all the time because it comes up a lot. Um, we belong. Even if everyone in this world should reject us, we belong because God has chosen us. He's adopted us. Um, we don't need to be like that guy in the dark who looked up and down the aisles and finally cried out, does anybody here recognize me? We can say without a shadow of a doubt, God recognizes us because he created us. He made us. He, he knows what we look like. He knows where we are all the time. And the thing is, is we ought to recognize each other. There should just be a knowing. I don't know if anybody else has this happen, but I'll be walking in the mall, and I like to make eye contact with people because I, it makes them uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> and I just like to see what their reaction will be, and then who knows, it could lead into a conversation or an opportunity to share the Lord. And, um, but there's times, not but, and there's times when I look and I, there's just a knowing and it's not because they remind me of somebody, but like, it's like God puts this unction in me to, to look. And I, I asked him, what is that? Why do I do that sometimes? My family says it's just because I like staring at people. <laughs> I, they, they, but, and I, and I do, I love watching people. I am a definite people watcher and I try to put together their life stories in my head and, um, or I like to go into old homes and just imagine conversations and I just go there. It's kind of weird, but, um, anyways, I asked the Lord one time, why is that? And he told me that's because they're your brother or sister in Christ. They belong to me and you recognize them. You sense the, the belonging, the relationship that is there. So that's, for me, that's pretty cool. Cause then I just smile. Um, it's not like I chase them down and say, hey, we got to talk because we're family. But I just have this knowing and it's encouraging to me that God would um, make those paths cross. Um, so the question I, I guess most of us would have is, well, it's not a question, but sometimes I look at the body of Christ and I wonder why we, and I include myself in that, aren't living, aren't grabbing hold of this inheritance that we have even now. What is it that causes us to live under the circumstances instead of receiving our inheritance now? Um, an inheritance, of course, if you've heard, it's something that's given when people die, right? Rarely, you can receive some of your inheritance early, which we receive all of our inheritance early and later. But most of the time, it's when someone has died. And in our case, Jesus has died. So we already have the inheritance, and he lives again, so we keep getting this inheritance. So that's kind of a, a pretty much all-encompassing promise because it's something that we don't have to wait for um, until someday. I wanted to read, it, read Romans 8, and I'm going to actually read 9 to 17. We're going to get to what you have on your paper in a minute, but I wanted you to hear it from the Message Bible because it really makes it come alive. It says, but if God himself has taken up residence in your life, you can hardly be thinking more of yourself than of him. 
anyone, of course, who has not welcomed this invisible but clearly present God, the Spirit of Christ, won't know what we're talking about. But for you who welcome him in whom he dwells, even though you still experience all the limitations of sin, you yourself experience life on God's terms. It stands to reason, doesn't it, that if the alive and present God who raised Jesus from the dead moves into your life, he'll do the same thing in you that he did in Jesus, bringing you alive to himself. When God lives and breathes in you, and he does, as surely as he did in Jesus, you are delivered from that dead life. With his spirit living in you, your body will be as alive as Christ's. So don't you see that we don't owe this old do-it-yourself life one red cent? There's nothing in it for us, nothing at all. The best thing to do is give it a decent burial and get on with your new life. God's spirit beckons. There are things to do and places to go. This resurrection life you receive from God is not a timid, grave-tending life. It's adventurously expectant, greeting God with a child like, what's next, Papa? God's spirit touches our spirits and confirms who we really are. We know who he is, and we know who we are, father and children. And we know we are going to get what's coming to us, an unbelievable inheritance. We go through exactly what Christ goes through. And if we go through the hard times with him, then we're certainly going to go through the good times with him. That's beautiful. That's a great promise. That's part, more than what you have written. But let's read Romans 8, 12 to 17, how you typically see it. <laughs> in the word of God. Let's read it together. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. That's, that's amazing scripture. I don't know. I mean, I'm going to try to get us to that place. where do you, do you get that we're joint heirs with Jesus? Everything that belongs to him belongs to us. The situation in this um, scripture, according to the previous verses, that there's a setup to him, to Paul saying this. He says, we are in Christ Jesus. Because we're in him, we're not standing next to him, we're not behind him, we are in Christ Jesus. Because we're in him, um, we walk as the Spirit of God leads. I hear Christians a lot say, I just don't know, you know where he's taking me or what he's, go what he's doing. Get in Christ <laughs> and the Spirit of God leads. That's verse 1. We are free from the law of sin and death because now we live under a new law, the law of the spirit of life. There's still a law, there's still rules, but it's the spirit of life that we live in. That's verse 2. We walk by the spirit, not the flesh. That's verse 3. That's just a given. That is our position. We don't go, well, I think I'll walk in the flesh today or I think I'll walk in the spirit today. And we act like that a lot of times. Oh, I got to Oh, Lord, help me to walk in you. And he's like, just get in me, and then I'll take the steps, and you just trot along. <clears throat> we live in the Spirit, so our minds are set on things of the Spirit, not the flesh. How many times don't we say, it's just so hard to concentrate. I just, I fall asleep, or I can't think of God, or I read, the, as soon as I start reading the Word, I just doze off, you know. <clears throat> we live in the Spirit. Get into the Spirit of God. Get in Jesus, and your minds will be set on the things of the Spirit, not the flesh. These are great reminders for me because when bad things happen or confusing things happen or there's tension in the house, guess what you set your mind on? 
the flesh, right? And Holy Spirit says, you just step back and out of me. Just step over and step back in. We always think God's the one that's moving, moved, when we don't feel his presence, when we don't know. Just get back in him. Just say, Lord, I got to get back in you. I'm sorry. I walked away. I got to get in because I'm concentrating. I'm focused on all this stupid stuff of this world. That's verse 5. And it's a huge step to freedom. Uh, we have spiritual minds. He said that. You are spiritually minded. When you have received Jesus Christ as your Savior, you can tell me all you want that you don't have a spiritual mind, but he says you do. He said it. So, And those kind of minds give us life and peace, no matter what's going on around and in us. Again, this is what keeps us sane, <laughs> moving forward when everything looks insane. Anybody have a really insane lives sometimes? You're like, oh... Lord, this is messed up. <laughs> um, we live because he lives in us, verse 11. That reminder again and again, this whole chapter. And then because I shared all of that because it, that's the therefore in verse 8 or 9. Therefore, because all of that is real and true and that's our position in Jesus Christ. Therefore, we owe a debt to live by the Spirit. We owe Jesus this debt. It's our responsibility to live in the spirit and not entertain our flesh. I can't even tell you how many Christians say, it's my turn. It's I deserve more. I deserve this. I des I'm like, really? We owe a debt to Jesus. He paid it all. He paid it all. All we have to do is live in him, which is kind of a privilege, right? This is not a have to. It's a get to. We get to do this. So we're in this position because of what Jesus has done for us. He placed us in that position. He is why we don't live according to our flesh. We don't listen to what our flesh tells us to do when it's opposed to God. He leads and we follow. And the reason is because he didn't give us a spirit of bondage, but he gave us a spirit of adoption. He adopted us. That's our position. We're his children. We belong to him. He owns us, so to speak. <laughs> We don't, well, that's, he redeemed us, so he bought us, so more than so to speak, it's real. We don't have to plead with God, asking him, do you recognize us? Are you seeing us, God? Where are you, God? He does. We're created in his image. He knows where we are, what we're doing. <clears throat> through adoption, whether in the natural or spiritual <clears throat> realm, through adoption, our position in life changes. Once we come into that relationship with him, our position changes. Our relationships change. Our actions change. Our lives change. Everything is supposed to change when we come into this new life. Our grandson is going to be baptized in a little bit here. He is going to, through baptism, through water and the word, come into this new life. His life changes I know people who don't get the whole infant thing, you can come to our baptism class <laughs> and we'll talk to you about God's hand, holy handshake and what faith is like for an infant. Anyways, um, all the rules change when we are adopted into Christ's family. The old is gone and the new has come. Now, when you think about it, is anybody adopted in this room or has adopted a child? Do we have any? Okay, so when you're adopted into an old, uh, a new family, you lose all rights to the old family, right? But you gain all the rights to the new family. So it's not like you keep some of these rights and then add some of these. You, that, that's cut off. That, that no longer exists. And with adoption comes a new family and a new name, right? Yes. yes. Legally. That's what happens through adoption. And it's the same with the adoption into the family of God. We lose all rights to our old nature, and we gain all the rights and privileges that come with our new nature. That's exciting. We got a new name, we have a new family, and we get to live by his rules. As we heard, these rules are the law of the spirit of life. That's what we get to live by. We represent God then. We live in him. We're led by him. We follow him. That's what you do when you become part of a family. 
You have your family rules. They don't have to be anybody else's rules, but they're your family, they're your family's rules. Verse 14 that you just read points that out vividly. After adoption into God's family, we are his sons and daughters. And we're led by the Spirit of God. We're not led by other people. We're not led by other things. We're led by the Spirit of God. And as I read from the Message Bible, that means that there are things we need to do in this life and places to go. If anybody's read the Dr. Seuss book, Oh, the Places You'll Go, I almost brought it and thought I'll just read that. Um, <laughs> But it's this encouragement to, to know that there's places to go. There's things to be done in this world. Just go. Just go and have some fun living by God's rules. So that's what this promise about being adopted and being heirs and uh, receiving this inheritance, that's, it gives us like go power. Go. Go do the things that he has called us to do. Now, he won't always handle situations the way we would like him to. <laughs> Dramatic pause. That's why he gives directions and leadership and encouragement to his people. In all likelihood, if I know exactly what I'm supposed to do, like without praying or without even being, I know that it's just me wanting that to happen. I mean, it can be even good things. But we have to, when we have to, um, when we're born into his family, we got to go the direction he's taking us. And it doesn't always look like we think it should. And the promise there, though, is that when we go as his children, we're never alone. When we feel like we're alone, it's because we went somewhere he wasn't. <laughs> we want to make sure we're in the right direction. There's this story about a man. He was searching for his family roots, and he visited several cemeteries at that point. And he was reading inscriptions on the tombstones. And on one of them was engraved this message. It said, um, pause now, stranger, as you pass by. As you are now, so once was I. As I am now, so soon you will be. Prepare yourself to follow me. But next to it, um, the tomb, on the tombstone, someone had placed, or next to the tombstone, someone placed a wood uh, little sign, and it was in, on there it was engraved, to follow you, I am not content until I know which way you went. <laughs> <laughs> So there. <laughs> I don't know if he kept looking for his family roots at that point. or. But as his adopted children, friends, we know which way we go. We know where we're going. All we have to do is follow Jesus. But to follow Jesus, we are going to have to know him. Know that he belongs to us just as much as we belong to him. Um, we have to understand this concept of Father God. And I've heard it said over and over that people really sometimes have a hard time connecting with Father because their earthly fathers were so, so bad. And that is very well and true. And, um, but it all, not, but, and it's no excuse not to get to know Father God. And we really need to stop, stop selling ourselves short there. There's no earthly dad who's perfect anyways, and some were really, really bad, and I understand that. Um, but we need to work through that so that we can see Father God as he really is. In this context, we find out that he's really Papa. He really is this loving, heavenly Father. Now, the Jewish people didn't use terms of endearment. They weren't, they weren't especially relational, not compared to the Hebrew people. Um, so Paul actually uses an Aramaic word to convey to us this relationship between Father God and us using the term Abba. And um, that, that literally means that there's this, it is Papa God. It's this, it's a term of endearment, a closeness, a love relationship. It's not God as the disciplinarian. That's not God as the judge. It's God who loves you and who will be there for you, who wraps you up in his arms and will take care of you. Um, this, it's a powerful, intimate term that, the, uh, that, that means grab hold. And what I read from the message, what's next, Papa God? What's next? What's next? Some people say, what's next, Daddy? Depending, whatever term of endearment you use for your, when, when you're in a good relationship with your dad at that time, 
Um, that's what, it, what it's trying to convey. Now everyone knows that the names and our titles we use in addressing people carry a meaning, right? Like if my husband calls me Julianne, just like my mom, I know I'm in trouble, <laughs> you know? That, that and it rarely comes out, <laughs> but if it does, I know I've pushed him to the limit. <laughs> um, there's feelings attached. I was thinking if my grandbabies, if any of them ever called me grandmother, I would certainly feel respected, but I'd wonder what's wrong with them, what's wrong with me, what's wrong with us, what's wrong with our relationship, because that's a very formal term for our family, okay? Um, instead, they call me Booma or Grandma, or the newest little one will call me Oma. I have three names for three different families now. Um, these are terms of endearment that our children have selected for their children in order to communicate this intimate, very special individual relationship that I share with each of them. So it's the same when my kids, when my kids call me mother or mother dearest, <laughs> then I know I, they're trying to make a point with me. Um, usually it's my girls trying to correct me, call me out, sometimes to tease me, but most of the time they feel like I've been just a little too harsh or too this or too that, and they mother dearest, you know, it's their little scolding. But when they call me mama or mom or mama bear, I don't know how I got to be mama bear, but I did, <laughs> I know that all is well in our relationship. Things are good right then. Now I could insert for my husband, daddy, papa, opa, dad, papa bear, grandpa, grandfather. It would be the same, depending on what is going on in the relationship at that time. Abba is an intimate word of endearment. It's meant to reveal closeness, a love that's undeniable. It's a relationship in which there is complete and total comfort. If you, during your prayer time, say, Abba, that means like you're just like this. You're like right there with each other. There's a level of transparency, a complete surrender, un unequivocally loved and unmatched by any other. So there's this openness. And I know I have people that say, well, I just, that's not who I am. And I'm always here to tell you it is who he created you to be. He created us to be lovers. And we create these comfort zones around us to protect ourselves because we've been hurt. And I used to, I know you probably won't believe this, but I no more would have hugged anybody than I would smile at anybody. And I said, that's how God made me, so you can accept me how I am or else just go away. <laughs> and then God revealed to me that that wasn't how he created us. He created all of us to be lovers. We really are all meant to be comfortable with each other. Ooh, that made some people really uncomfortable, didn't it? <laughs> I had a lady hug me this morning and she did the side hug. And I said, and, and I know I'm supposed to respect people, so I get that. And I said, you really do the side hug? And she goes, that's the only kind of hug I do. I said, oh, well, the only kind I do is the front hug. <laughs> So I wrapped her up and she got very uncomfortable with me. <laughs> Don't yell at me. Don't say I pushed. It's okay. We, I know her. I'll talk. I'll go tell her. I'm, yeah, we'll talk later. But the love coming from our father through our adoption, I need you to know it's undifferentiated. It's like he doesn't love any of us anymore. I mean, I tease and say I'm his favorite one, but, and I really am his favorite one. <laughs> but so are you. And so are you and you and you. We, like, he can have everybody as his favorite ones, and he does. He doesn't look at the Jewish people and say, well, they're my favorites, so too bad for those of you I've adopted. There's no differentiation for him. He loves us all um, because his love is pure. There's a Sunday school teacher. She was registering kids um, for classes, and she asked these two brothers to give her their birth dates. And one of them said, well, we're seven years old, and my birthday is April 8th, 2004, and his birthday is April 20th, 2004. The teacher was confused and said, well, that's impossible. And the, and the other brother smiled and said, oh, no, it's not impossible. One of us is adopted. And before she had time to think about what she should say, she goes, which one? And the boys looked at each other with knowing grins, and they said, well, we asked mom and dad that a while ago, but 
They just said they loved us and they couldn't remember which one they adopted. <laughs> and I love that picture because that's, I could see God saying that it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter when you received me. I, it doesn't matter. The, what matters is that you belong to me now. And there's no differentiation between the love that I have for my kids. You're all my favorite ones. So because we have this very loving Papa God, um, we get to approach him without fear of rejection. We can go with complete confidence because we know that we're adopted. I personally don't have a good relationship with my dad. I never have. So it took me a lot longer to embrace Father God. But he kept drawing me in and drawing me in because that's what he does. He's like, I want to show you what true love really is. I want to show you what it can be like. So let go of all of the other stuff and let me love you because that's what he does. In Psalm 68, 5, God tells us he's a father to the fatherless. I love that. And that doesn't just mean those that are out on the street, but it's those that fathers were absent emotionally. Maybe fathers were absent spiritually. He's a father to the fatherless. In Isaiah 64, 8, it says, God is the potter, and we are the work of his hand. See, not only did God create us, but he continues to remake us. And I love that picture, that he wasn't done with me once I came out of the womb, that he's still making and molding us. In Matthew 6, 9, we find out he's our father in heaven with this perfect holy name. Also a good thing. In Matthew 7, 11, he's a father who gives good gifts. In 1 Peter 1, 17, we find out that he judges our thoughts and deeds so we know how just he is and kind of how intimate he is. He knows what you're thinking right now. I don't know, that, that's like, wow. In Romans 8, 15, it says, which we read, we, we've received, we have received the spirit of sonship. So we get to cry out. Because of that, we get to cry out, Papa God, Abba, Father, Come. So in reality, through adoption by God, we are literally born into and adopted into a new life. Um, and then we're, we're, we're made to continue in it. And along with um, literally coming into that relationship, we're legally brought into that relationship. And that's where the heirship comes in. Um, when God adopts us, we're literally his children, but we're legally his children because um, through adoption, that's what happens. And when you're adopted, you become heir of that inheritance. Okay? So it's not like, well, only the biological kids get the inheritance. If you're adopted, you all get the same. Does anybody, and then it says we're joint heirs. Does anybody have a joint checking account? And so does that joint checking account mean that you only have that some of you or two of one of you got that <laughs> joint can be two or more people but do you have access to part of the money or all of the money all of, money. All of it and who has access to all of it all. yeah whoever's name is on there right so you can you have access to the whole thing and that's something that we have to think about when it comes to Jesus just like we're joint heirs with him so just like he had access and has access to everything, we have access to everything. That's beautiful. That's more than beautiful. Um, so as heirs, we receive an inheritance. And an inheritance makes us the beneficiary of things that we did nothing to deserve except that we were adopted or born into a family. <laughs> Some of, some of it can be material, some of it's sentimental value, and some of it's just the spiritual legacy, which is, to me, most important of all, if there's a spiritual legacy. But no matter what the amount of an inheritance is, it means we get something that we didn't earn, um, likely don't even deserve. <laughs> and at the very least, it's something more than we had before. Inherent inheritances are given freely because of the relationship that we had. Pastor Mark's mom died last in September, and so he and his two brothers and one sister got an inheritance from their mom and dad, and it was split four ways, even Stephen. 
They received what was theirs simply because they belonged to mom and dad. And then we get the benefits of it because we're related to them. Just, it's a, an amazing thing. It's very, a very humbling thing when you receive something that you did nothing to deserve. You, you know, she would, they were great stewards of their, and we didn't get rich by the way, but, but we got an inheritance and it was something that we didn't have before. And it was, it came out of their willingness to be good stewards and to leave something for the next generation. Um, our inheritance as heirs of God as children likewise just comes because we're in relationship with him. We, didn't, we get things from him that we don't, don't deserve, that we didn't earn, that he doesn't owe us, but he gives it freely to us because of this promise of adoption. And nothing, honestly, nothing on earth um, could come close to measuring up to what he has left for us to to access even now. In 1 Corinthians 2.9 it says, but as it is written, eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. And again, you can think that only pertains to heaven, but he's prepared things for us here and there. And we might as well start making some withdrawals here <laughs> and enjoy the things that he's given to us. Okay, I gave you, I'm not going to share any more, but we've, um, I gave you some thoughts there. What I do want you to do is take just the next three to four or five minutes to talk about um, those questions at the end. What, really apply this. What will you do different this week to live in your inheritance? What withdrawal will you take? I already know, I'm, I have a friend, and anyone who is in Via de Cristo knows we have a friend who's lying in a hospital She's probably my age or maybe younger. Her name is Loretta, and she's, they don't know what's wrong with her. She's like disappearing before their eyes. She had some eye problems, and they discovered she does have a, a had, had a few minor seizures, but they don't know what's wrong with her, but she, they had to put a feeding tube because she just sleeps, and, and every test run comes back normal, normal, normal. So she's been in the hospital a week tomorrow and um, I'm gonna go claim some of my inheritance this week with her. Because it's her inheritance. I don't know what's going on, but I know the doctors don't know, so God does. And since we as his ambassadors, we get to go. have time to deal with that one conditional clause and that that and I dealt with that before um, by leading up to those verses what God we are in Christ so everything comes by grace through faith and it comes in Christ and then we have to exercise that exercise that faith yeah. um, to stay in to to and we have data because we are going to fall short and the Bible says we all sin and fall short of the glory of God so, but that's not an excuse then not to keep exercising our faith. The Bible says that we're to die daily. And so there is this practice, this discipline that we get to exercise in our lives in order to, and that comes from recognizing who Jesus is and how he enables us and then walking in that. And, no, and it's very quick. Oh, whoa, my flesh just rose up and that's what I was following. And so... That's the journey of faith. That's the journey of, it's not about salvation at this point. It's about accessing and living in that freedom that comes through. So if you do this, then this is what happens. Those 
And I love that that, I mean, very often we ask, and you'll hear it is the more you get to know God, you'll hear in prayer people asking God to do this and that for them when he clearly tells us our part in scripture. Very often we'll say, well, God, to give me that peace that passes understanding. And he says, you need to let my peace that passes understanding. It's there. I have it available to you. You just let it happen now. Or we'll ask God, can you, can you just change my heart? You know, and he's like, um, I am doing that. I renew your heart daily. You know, you're transformed by it. So it's taking those, so it's understanding God's principles of life and not making them a have to, but I get to do this now. I, you know, we tell our kids that all the time. They go, do we have to go to Sunday school? Oh, no, you don't have to, but you get to. You know, that's, you get to do these things. You get, you get to rise up to the occasion. You get to rise up to what God has for us. It's it's should be God does challenge us, but they're they're meant for our good. Those are good things. I mean, I don't know about you, but it's kind of boring now just to if he only set the bar like this. Well, goodness, most of us have jumped over that. We didn't have to jump. We just got to step over. But he's got the bar up here and it's awesome. And it's a it's a privilege. And yet we're shaken <laughs> because we're like, oh, you know, is God really going to do it? Is God really? And then he, we're confronted with our own inability so that we rely on his ability in us. So for me, it's, it's minute by minute relying on his grace. And I, I just, uh, I don't know where I said it. Maybe it's in uh, something else I wrote. But I said um, every moment that we, one of the, I don't know if it was Charles Spurgeon or one of, he said every moment that we live, every minute we live here on earth is a minute of grace that we get to live in. Every single minute. So no matter what we're doing, I think the idea is that we don't just settle. And we just don't say, well, I'm a sinner, so God understands and it's all good to go. Because he, he, no, you got to take those sins. Just like we have to take thoughts captive into obedience. We, we have to do that. He doesn't take those thoughts from us. We have to take those thoughts captive into obedience. So, hope that helps. Um, now you don't have time to talk, but do have do take the time for yourself then, or maybe with one other person to say, "This is what I'm going to do to walk into my inheritance or gr take a withdrawal from my inheritance." But apply what you hear today to real life when you leave these walls, so that it becomes so much more real to you. Amen. God bless you.